Hey US History, welcome back to our number three video in our screencast series. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at the Vietnam War. I've got two versions of this video. This will be the fast version. I also have a in-depth look at this. Uh, if you're interested, let me know, uh, let your teacher know and I can get you the YouTube link. Now, to fully understand the Vietnam War, you gotta go all the way back to Versailles. Versailles is the place where this thing all starts because at Versailles, there's this huge movement towards uh, self-determination uh, determinization and civil uh, liberties and freedoms for colonized countries. Ho Chi Minh, who we see here, he's going to be an activist on the part of Vietnam who wants to see Vietnam freed from France. He fails. Why? Because the victorious powers need their colonies after World War I because of all the economic calamity. So Ho Chi Minh decides, well, if the, you know, the forces of democracy and capitalism aren't with me, then I'll turn to the communists if I have to. Uh, but he is always going to resolve for a free, independent Vietnam. So from Ho Chi Minh's perspective, every single action that takes place in Vietnam from 1919 up through 1973 when uh, the United States fully withdraws, this is all about liberation. And it doesn't matter who he's liberating his people from. Now, from his perspective, the number one enemy is going to be the French. The French hold the colonial uh, reins of Vietnam uh, and are holding the Vietnamese back. The French are importing culture, they're importing religion, they're destroying traditions and values uh, from a socioeconomic and sociocultural perspective of the Vietnamese. Ho Chi Minh and many of his followers who will eventually become the Viet Minh uh, want the French out. Um, at first, it looks like they might get their way because the Japanese during World War II will invade Vietnam, but they are horrible overlords. And uh, very quickly, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh turn from resisting the French to highly uh, resisting the Japanese. And that would make them allies of the United States. So when World War II ends, the Viet Minh and Ho Chi Minh think, hey, this is our shot. We, we missed it in 1919, but we'll get it in 1945. Wrong again. The Vietnamese people are given back to the French. Why? Because the French need Vietnam because it's the same old story. Horrible war, need the resources, need the prestige. So the French get to hold Vietnam. And one of the things that uh, the Viet Minh decide to do now after their fighting experience against the Japanese is to actively resist using military forces. This will eventually culminate in a civil war between the northern and southern sections of uh, the, the holding uh, of Vietnam that will lead to this epic battle like a Vietnam French Alamo called Dien Bien Phu, where the French lose, even though you might have thought they would win, being a first world power and the Vietnamese people being insurgents, but you know, the American Revolution, so the, these things happen. And uh, it looks like Ho Chi Minh is going to get what he wants. The Viet Minh have been victorious. There's a peace conference and a, a set of accords that are going to take place in Geneva, Switzerland. And it looks like he's going to get his way. Hey, we're going to be freed. Wrong again, right? Because the, the, the world is not ready for a freed Vietnam because the world is embroiled in the Cold War. And Ho Chi Minh had hitched his wagon to communism. China has fallen. Uh, Truman uh, had failed to, to defeat the communists in China. Eisenhower wins election in 50 by saying, hey, we lost China. We're not going to lose anymore. We've got containment. We've got the domino theory. We've got all those old, well-trodden Cold War paths that we could go down. And so the United States backs a leader that they think will fight against the communists, this guy, Ngo Dinh Diem. Diem is a disaster. He's highly unpopular. His brother is like, um, like you know, think of the Gestapo or the NKVD or secret police or any of these sort of secret organizations that spirit people away in the night and execute them in basements. That's what Diem's brother is in charge of, essentially, inside of his own country. And so the Geneva Accords, which divide the United, uh, excuse me, divide uh, Vietnam into North and South Vietnam, South Vietnam is saddled with the sadistic leader. Self-determination is supposed to take place in South Vietnam, but the United States is going to have its finger on the scale the entire time so that Diem can be the guy. Um, Bao Dai, who had been the previous leader of South Vietnam, is viewed as highly unreliable. Uh, he's got links to Japan. He's got links to um, corruption. Let's get Bao Dai out. Let's get Diem in. Diem will be great. But again, no Diem Nu. He's the brother of Diem. He, this guy is crap cracking down on people left and right. Uh, specifically, he's cracking down the, on the Buddhist monks uh, and on Buddhism in general. Uh, he's, he's rounding people up. There's these awful land reforms out in the rural areas of South Vietnam that are supposed to make Vietnam you know, better. Think about like 
the the collective reforms that you learned about in world history under Stalin or under um, uh, Chairman Mao, those never work. And guess what? They didn't work with a capitalist leader either. And so what ends up happening is that you have these massive protests. They culminate in these uh, burning monk protests and a civil war that's fought between uh, the, the anti-DM forces and the pro-DM forces. And DM is really backed up by the United States. He's backed up by the CIA and American muscle. Why? Because he's willing to stand in the breach against communism, against Ho Chi Minh, who wants to unify the country because he doesn't view this as a communist capitalist struggle he views this as an independence thing right and so uh dm says i'll fight the communists the united states says we don't like the communists so thank you for standing with us ho chi minh says i don't care communists i don't care capitalists i want vietnamese people and then you've got all this tension you've got the Viet Minh starting to infuse into the south the Viet Cong are there everything gets really really crazy dm's going to end up being assassinated right around the same time that kennedy is assassinated and all hell is about to break loose right so these monk pro protests that start off as this like anti DM regime um, uh, set of actions where these guys are literally going to um, 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 emulate, emulate my, my tongue, my brain. Um, they're going to light themselves on fire and just sit there and burn to death without saying a word. And it's very, very powerful. And it catches the eye of the world. What's going on in South Vietnam? What's going on in South Vietnam? The United States is in South Vietnam. So they're going to have to deal with these sorts of things, right? Oh, looks like my slideshow got a little out of order there. Here. So what ends up happening is after Kennedy is assassinated, LBJ takes over. Uh, he is willing to step in more than Kennedy was. Kennedy had been running this advisory sort of thing where he was going to look at the uh, the army of uh, South Vietnam, the ARVN, A-R-V-N. He was going to help them out because they're fighting the communists, but he doesn't want to get super involved in this sort of thing. Think about like Bay of Pigs and gun shyness with Kennedy not wanting to get super involved. Kennedy's killed in Dallas. LBJ takes over. LBJ wants to focus on domestic policy reform. Why? Because he's a new dealer who came up under FDR. He wants America to be great. Domestic policy is his thing. In order to get his domestic policy endeavors through, though, he needs to cut some some deals with war hawks who want to see more pushback against the Vietnam uh, becoming a communist country. So he's going to make these deals. Why? Because then these legislators will vote for great society initiatives that we looked at in the last couple of videos, like the Civil Rights Act, uh, for example. And so uh, LBJ kind of makes this devil's deal. And then in 1964, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution uh, is passed after the USS Maddox is attacked by this PT boat. Was it? Wasn't it? There's a still a great amount of debate even to this day. Eventually, though, what happens is Congress, led by the Senate, voting 88 to 2, so it was really, really popular uh, for any revisionist historians out there. They... Congress basically writes this blank check that says, hey, LBJ, your administration can take any steps necessary to push back against communists if you need to uh, protect the United States. And you can just look at this as like a blank check, right? Hey, go do what you got to do, right? Well, now if you are part of the United States government that is, is really itching for a fight, you can essentially go ahead and fight a war, right? And that's what we're going to see happen. So what ends up happening here is that uh, United States forces really up their presence in Vietnam starting in 1964 and 1965. Operation Rolling Thunder, search and destroy missions, uh, rooting out Viet Cong insurgents. These would be like the rebel fighters who might be southern Vietnamese citizens or who may have been imported secretly by the North Vietnamese to the South Vietnamese. There becomes this really big struggle militarily to control the South uh, Vietnam and punish North Vietnam. So Rolling Thunder is all about World War II carpet bombing initiatives in the north to try to bomb them in submission. In the south, uh, the United States is going to go out and they're going to find these communists in the jungle. Well, the jungle is a jungle and it's really hard to see through, right? And so the United States starts to deploy some asymmetrical warfare uh, so, sorts of weaponry uh, uh, like Agent Orange, uh, which is a chemical defoliant, which was supposed to strip the leaves off of the trees and so make it so these guys can't hide in the jungle and the undergrowth, right? And if you can't deforest an area, then you could burn it out. So you could drop napalm. Napalm is this jelly gasoline mixture that when it hits, it explodes, it burns, it'll burn underwater. It doesn't stop. It's horrible sort of stuff. We'll burn out the jungle if we can't 
like poison the jungle, right? This is going to have horrible effects on the people, right? If you get this chemical on you, Agent Orange has been linked to all manners of cancer um, and all sorts of disorders, uh, mental disorders. After the fact, Agent Orange was nasty, nasty stuff. In fact, uh, it was, was one of many different chemical defoliants. Uh, we call it Agent Orange because it came in a barrel with an orange stripe on it, and it's just loaded into these giant crop duster planes that are just spraying it up and down the desert um, to create these wide open areas. And then, you know, napalm, napalm indiscriminate you drop it from the sky it hits the ground it explodes it burns anything it lands on so we get these horrible images of families and children and, and villages destroyed uh, on the ground the American forces are rooting out communists they're going on these search and destroy missions where the whole point was not to go get the territory it was to go get the idea of communism and the communist soldier and so under the guise of Robert McNamara who he had been a technocrat at the Ford Automotive Company and and have been a part of bomber command uh, during the the Second World War he says, hey, we'll hit this tipping point. We kill enough of these guys and they'll stop fighting because they'll realize that fighting against us is bad at news. We've got all this modern American technology. Hey, big green machine. It's the United States. We can kill these guys in such numbers that will stop them from coming down. You know what? If you're part of this idea of liberation warfare, that doesn't matter to you, right? It didn't matter uh, at Lexington and Concord. It didn't matter to the French resistance fighting against the Nazis. And it's not going to matter to the Viet Cong and the NVA who believe they're not fighting a communist struggle. They're fighting to get rid of oppressive colonial powers. Now the United States, right? And so it doesn't matter how you know bad things get. It doesn't matter how big the body count gets. It doesn't matter about May Lai, where whole villages are destroyed and horrible war crimes occur. Like none of this matters, right? And, and it also doesn't matter the peaceful things um, that are done, like building um, uh, hospitals and wells and electrifying the rural area. TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority uh, project for Vietnam. The the whole idea of winning the hearts and the minds of the people of South Vietnam. Um, many people either a didn't care about the political uh, ideologies of the time period. They just wanted the war to stop or they really felt like, you know what? We don't want the United States here. We don't like the guys like DM that you had been backing. Like you guys have done nothing but bad, right? All of this ends up leading to the removal of LBJ as the American president and uh, the Tet offensive. So let's really quickly get through these two events. Let's start with Tet. Tet is a ceasefire time period. It's a holiday. It's a lunar holiday. Uh, going back to the beginning of the war, nobody fought on Tet. Except for in 1968, the Viet Cong launched a series of offensive. They're, they, they don't work. They're not successful from a military standpoint, but they're highly successful from a propaganda standpoint. Edward R. Murrow will famously say after the Tet Offensive, he sees no pathway towards victory for the United States in the Vietnam War. The imagery, like we see here, this uh, this execution photo, um, the, the number of Americans killed, uh, if you've seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, that's way a uh, horrible battle that takes place. Um, the, the you know you have like Kaysan, um and cut off uh, forces during 1968 as a result of Tet. The Tet Offensive is a PR win for the forces of North Vietnam and communism, and the American people start to protest, right? And so they're like, we don't want to fight anymore. We don't want to fight anymore. LBJ says, hey, I won't seek, nor will I accept nomination for the election to president in 1968. He says, I'm out. He later tries to get back in. The Democratic Party's having none of it. They've got this golden boy. His name's Bobby, Bobby Kennedy. He's assassinated in California in 68. Uh, the, the, the convention is highly contested uh, in Chicago, leading to all sorts of riots. At the same time, in the Republican Party, you've got Goldwater, who's willing to use nuclear weapons if it ends the war, shades of Korea and what we saw in the Atomic Cafe. And then you've got Nixon. Nixon's trying to get a political third act going on. Uh, he's going to court the South. The South is highly against the Democrats because of LBJ's Great Society and civil rights legislation. This leads to uh, Nixon gathering up this, this moral vote, this silent majority. He has the Southern strategy of bringing in um, a lot of the discontented Southern Democrats who will flip over to the Republican Party. Nixon becomes president and he says, hey, listen, we'll Vietnam, uh, Vietnamization, we'll take Vietnam and we'll turn this into a Vietnam War. We'll start pulling U.S. boys out. We'll start putting the Arvin to the front and we'll start finding a way towards peace with honor, right? 
that also fails. The Arvin is a horrible fighting force. They lose battle after battle after battle. Then uh, North Vietnamese will start using the Ho Chi Minh Trail and Cambodia and Laos as a way to get more and more people and supplies into the south. So Nixon says, hey, we'll just go and invade and we'll bomb those places out. That leads to more protests. The same thing that brought down LBJ. Nixon needs to find a way to get out. By 71, 72, he realizes it's all over. And Vietnam, Kissinger finds a way to get them out of the war. Um, the United States leaves. Peace with dishonor is probably more like it. Uh, there's a highly disorganized evacuation of the U.S. Embassy, and the Vietnam War ends in 1975. All right, so take a look at the uh, notes. See you guys later.